does Amin Muhammad you know, and we're so glad to be at your service for the third series of National Online Nursing Informatics Short Courses. Like previous courses, we have participants from different countries. So good morning, good evening, good night to all of you. The current course, Technology Solutions to Telenursing and Generating Knowledge will be attended for two months, which consists of one month of the synchronized sessions and another month of unsynchronized sessions, a session per week, directed by Dr. Khatara Seilani, Associate Professor at Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and moderated by Dr. Asya Darvish, lecturer at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. First of all, I appreciate our dear lecturers from, for the presence, Professor Tony Hebda, Dr. Milod Rose, and Professor Caroline Sipes who are experts in nursing informatics and great university lecturers in the USA. And I should mention the fame in publications like books and articles in nursing informatics. Thanks to Dr. R.P. Manakian, Associate Professor and Vice Dean of International Affairs of the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and International Affairs of, of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And also a special thanks to a praise to raise team at this moment, we have an invaluable speech by Professor Ali Reza Nikbah Nasrabadi, Dean of the School of Nursing and Wifery at the Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Um, do we have Dr. Nikbah here with us? Uh, actually, I don't know now if he's in the participants or not. I will check it. Thank you. And no, so please continue. Then we can have Dr. Nikbach later. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Before Professor Hepta starts to lecture, I kindly ask you to answer the poll, which is launched on your screen as a pretest. The poll is launched now. Thanks for your participation. Please, dear participants, do, do participate in the poll, and uh, in this way, you can test your learning. Thank you. Eighteen percent of participants have done it. Thank you, and we're waiting for them to do more. Twenty six percent, thank you.
45 percent thank you we're waiting for more While you're doing the poll, um, I wanna tell the name of the countries that we have participate, participants from, uh, which are Iran, Iraq, Ghana, Turkey, Nigeria, UAE, UK, USA, India, Palestine, Germany, Poland, Canada, Egypt, England, Qatar, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Georgia, Philippines, Indonesia, Italy, Brazil, Morocco, and Lithuania. Thank you all for your participation. We have 65% of our participants done the pretest. Thank you all. We're waiting for others. Okay, please, Mr. Mohammadi. I think uh, when it reach uh, seventy percent, you can end the poll. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. It's already sixty-six percent of our participants. Yes, because some uh, participants uh, just now um, added to the session. Right. Okay, thank you. You can end the poll. 72%. Thank you. Okay. Now we have Professor Tony Hepta, Professor at College of Nursing from the USA. 
Informatics Nursing Board Certification from American Nurse Credentialing Center, Certified Nurse, nurse Educator from National League for Nursing. With more than 35 years of experience, research, grants, and publications, articles, and books on nursing informatics. Hello, Professor Habda. We're all eyes and ears. Thank you. And on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Dr. Rose and Dr. Sipes, we are most pleased to be with you today. And we recognize the wonderful efforts of the Tehran University of Medical Sciences for these webinars and for establishing um, nursing informatics. So forgive me here as I advance my slides. Um, so again, I want to acknowledge everyone and thanks to the Dean, the Vice Dean and the Director, Dr. Darvish and the entire university and school of nursing. It is a wonderful thing that you are doing. It is a wonderful opportunity to be with you today with a diverse international audience. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, yes. Well, great. Thank you. I just wanted to- Yes, thank you. I went further. So the objectives for my part of the presentation today as we move forward are to provide an overview of connected health and to discuss the prerequisite for, the for developing a connected health system to address the correlation between connected health, a learning health system, consolidating health information and generation of knowledge, and to discuss the role of supporting technologies with connected health. And lastly, to discuss the role that professional communication and organizations play with connected health. Also, I am cognizant of our need to move forward. So please help me keep on time. So how did we get from technology solutions for telenursing and generating knowledge to talking about connected health? Let me digress a moment and say how that happened. As we were planning the lecture series and asked to talk about several topics that included telehealth and telenursing, connected health has traditionally been used as an umbrella term to cover telemedicine, telehealth, telenursing, and mobile health or mHealth. When you review the literature, it's also used to discuss a system or model of care and in a broader context to connect clinicians, consumers, and patients using technology and to improve outcomes and quality while reducing costs. And we sometimes will hear it referred to as healthcare 4.0. And 4.0, of course, also incorporates the Internet of Things, the various sensors and uh, wearable and implantable technologies that we use, as well as all of the knowledge and data that is generated in the process. So we, many of you already have these things in your respective settings. And that's wonderful. Others are making the journey and getting there. Of course, we also have things such as robotics. So we just have all this wonderful technology. So what are the components of connected health? Well, obviously the traditional uh, thinking of telehealth, telemedicine, mobile health, and the various apps that people use today to maintain wellness and um, follow their disease, but also all of the supporting technology. Much of it is behind the scenes. Dr. Rose will speak to you further about that. And also a concept known as the learning health system. And we will talk further about the learning health system. Obviously, we generate much data, an overwhelming amount of data. How is it used? Well, in the United States, we've had many silos of data. We have a disease registry over here. We have a hospital system over there. 
we have data that comes from various mobile devices, many consumer facing that are not necessarily added to the patient record. While we aspire to have a birth to death electronic health record, that's a comprehensive record for every individual. We have not achieved that in the United States. We have gotten a little closer, but we still have many, many problems before we can get to that um, area. So there are a number of prerequisites that are required in order to in order to um, reach a connected health system. We need a policy, law, and uh, reimbursement framework. We need a culture. We need consumer acceptance. We need knowledge and skill sets and technical elements and communication and collaboration. I will speak a bit further about each in turn. I'm sorry, I think I advanced my slides too far. Um, it seems I left out a slide, my apologies. In talking further about the uh, policy and law and reimbursement pieces, we have a number of policy influencers, not only in the United States, but across the globe. In the United States, we have the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, a federal entity that is charged with coordinating national efforts to implement and use health information technology and advance not only the use of health information technology, but also improve healthcare. We have a number of professional groups that have a policy arm, such as the American Medical Association, the American Nurses Association. We have a number of informatics groups that formulate policy and make recommendations for legislation. We also have a number of other groups and just a representation includes the Kaiser Family Foundation, the National Quality Forum, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and there are many others, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, the Urban Institute and Center for American Progress in Healthcare. Also, from a legislative perspective, some prerequisites to helping us to get to a connected health system in the United States included a series of laws. We had the Health Information Portability Act and Protection Act, HIPAA, and it required electronic submission of claims. So it helped to get us a little bit closer in moving from paper to uh, an electronic system. We have also had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and it's high tech or health information technology and economic and clinical health um, or high tech act, which provided uh, incentives for the adoption of electronic health records and also for aggregate collection of data. So that helped to get us a little bit further down the road towards an electronic or digital healthcare system. The Affordable Care Act and its hospital readmissions reduction program, which means that providers do not get paid if patients are readmitted within a certain period of time for the same diagnosis, requires data collection to prove quality is delivered. We also have the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act, known as MACRA, which sets up established rewards for achieving certain quality measures. And my apologies that my voice has gotten to be very rough. I am very sorry for that. We have a number of groups in addition to the professional groups mentioned before that have provided initiatives to facilitate data sharing. And if it seems that I'm hopping, it's not that I intend to 
have flight of ideas, but data is a central concept to establishing a connected health system, not only for the individual health, but for aggregate health, for population health. So we have many initiatives. The World Health Organization developed a core set of principles for data sharing during the public health emergencies. We also have the Canada Health Info Way, which is a national government funded initiative towards a pan-Canadian electronic health record. We have the fair data principles that declared that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, all fundamental principles to enable us to share data so that we can all learn. And the 21st Century Cures Act in the United States was intended to prevent information blocking because we have what may be a very foreign concept to many of you, we have many private healthcare systems, hospitals, that really don't want to share information. And we have software that may vary from location to location. And the commercial vendors of the software also didn't want to make, make it easy to share data from system to system because they wanted you to adopt their system so they could have an economic advantage. I will not mention all of the other um, initiatives that are listed there, but there are many groups that you can turn to to see how they set up their data sharing initiative and principles and whether they set up a cloud or a repository, um, but many examples there for you. We also have in terms of changing policies, publication policies that now we have the International Committee of Medical Journal editors declared an ethical responsibility to share data that is generated through research. So when people are submitting research studies to these journals, then they must, uh, they must adhere to the provisions set forth by the journal to share their data. We also have a number of organizations, very often it's genomic and cancer related and rare diseases that have been leaders in setting up collaboratives for sharing data. So there is much interesting literature out there and I have provided all of the reading that I did and the journals at the end of my slide presentation, which I know that Dr. Darvish will make available to you if you choose to avail yourself of it. Also, to change, to create a connected health system where we have data generated and used throughout the entire system, it requires a level of commitment. Commitment on the part of not only administration, but commitment on the part of all of the healthcare workforce, as well as consumers. But it is a process whereby we have continuous data collection and continuous quality improvement efforts. And that also requires not only sharing within organizations, but also that the data has to be in formats that's amenable for it to be shared. So we already talked about legislation that fostered information being digital in format, but we also have a number of standard terminologies that are helpful in that process as well, and data must be available. And we need to build a skilled workforce, which I will speak to a bit further shortly. I did allude to the fact that we need to have consumer buy-in 
to develop a connected healthcare system. And that we need to have consumers that when they present for healthcare, accept and even demand that this is a facility that makes use of ongoing research findings, as well as data that is generated within the care process. So that is their expectation. We need to have them uh, also prepared to provide information related to their care experiences that can be used to provide care for others. We have many surveys that are done in the United States, including questions that may seem reminiscent of what you would expect if you evaluate another type of service besides healthcare. Were people friendly? Did they explain the treatments? Was the facility clean? And some of those things may not seem as germane to treatment, but overall it affects the consumer perception of their care. Consumer buy-in for this entire framework is that the healthcare professional and worker also has to accept it because their acceptance is key to their participation, to their um, collection in data, ensuring data quality, and ensuring that they are able to apply the findings. Knowledge and skills. Knowledge and skills that are required in this setting for the healthcare workforce include informatics competencies. That should come to no surprise as the group that we have before us, because obviously you have an interest in informatics or you would not be here. There are the traditional informatics skills such as basic computer literacy, information literacy, and we go down the pike. But increasingly, there are discussions within the informatics community that informatics competencies need to also incorporate data science knowledge and skills, not only for the person that seeks to specialize in informatics, but we need to have a base level of data science knowledge and skills among our basic practitioners as well. And in addition to the ability to understand and use artificial intelligence, and Dr. Rose will be speaking to you further about artificial intelligence. And I know that in talking further about telehealth delivery and telenursing, that Dr. Sipes has a number of specific competencies that she will also address with you. So that will be in the future. To create this connected healthcare system, it requires very technical um, elements as well. We have the technical elements. We know about things like HL7 for the physical transmission of data between computer systems. We've alluded to standardized terminology so that we all use SNOMED, for instance, or we may also use additional standardized terminologies that are recognized. We need to have interoperability. And in recent years, that increasingly has come to refer to FIRE um, for electronic health records. as being an important standard to make sure that we have a certain level of communication between and among health records. And we need to have a robust information system infrastructure. We have had coming along historically, and it may be true for some of you in your respective nations, that we have wonderful systems that may stand alone. So we may have a wonderful nursing informatics system but it does not talk to the medical system, or we may have a robust electronic health record within a particular hospital or hospital system, 
but it may not talk to the public health systems within your, your nation. In the United States, we still struggle to have what we call regional information exchanges. We have some of them, but we do not have them uniformly across the country. So we may have in a particular setting, this hospital system talks with the regional exchange, the pharmacy systems in the locale are also connected um, so that you can find out what drugs your patient is on when they come into the system. Um, but it's a patchwork, it's not uh, universal. And this was really pointed out as a problem during COVID that our public health infrastructure was woefully inadequate, um, outdated, and uh, needed much more work. Communication and collaboration. We need to get rid of the data silos. Data silos, we amass wonderful data, but it does no good if it's not shared with other parties, because as we know, then we have to gather the same data all over again by a different population. So the nurses need to gather the same data that the physicians gather, or it may sit out in a public health information system somewhere else. So we need to talk across disciplines within a hospital system, across healthcare settings. So in a connected health system, we should have data that flows from long-term healthcare settings, hospital settings, subacute healthcare settings, um, nursing homes, um, public health systems, the community, um, nursing agencies that take care of people in the home settings, across all of the different disciplines, pharmacies, uh, physicians, nurses, therapists, or physical therapy, occupational therapy. We also need to have communication that occurs across the various professional and informatics associations. Again, as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes these groups advance policy statements to impact public policy within your nation, your funding, and your legislation. We also need to have communication within communities of practice. If you're not familiar with the, the term communities of practice, a community of practice um, is a group usually voluntarily formed, but not necessarily, but it can be just across nursing. It can be in uh, across different disciplines but it is an informal learning group that has interactions between experts and novices. The group may vary in its structure. It can be very loosely formed, resembling a support group, while at other times it has an express purpose, such as learning or promoting more about research, publication, scholarship, perhaps how to integrate evidence-based practice within your setting. Um, so it provides a social structure that provides support to say the younger people, the novice professionals who then can't learn as a result. Now, in speaking to the learning, the connected health system earlier, I said that there were parts or components. The care modalities, which included telehealth, telenursing, as well as more traditional modalities in acute care. The supporting in technologies, which Dr. Rose will speak to further, and something called the learning health system. If you're not familiar with the learning health system, it's really a pivotal concept. It was addressed as a new model for healthcare approximately 15 years ago by an advisory body, once known as the Institute of Medicine, which in the United States has morphed into something that we call the National Academies of Medicine. 
and they proposed it as a new model for healthcare that would address many of the issues that plague the US healthcare system because we are not doing the best job by any means. And we certainly do not adhere, we do not hold ourselves up as experts in all things. We lead in many technology developments, but we are among the last in the value for care uh, that is received and the outcomes for our population. So it's shameful and we need to do more. But with the learning health system, a definition by our agency for healthcare research and quality, which is a division within our department of health and human sciences. It's defined as a health science system in which internal data and experience are systematically integrated with external evidence like research findings, and that knowledge is put into practice. So what you have as shown in this schematic from the same source is that the learning health system is continuously generating data as a result of patient care processes and this data is analyzed and it fuels and becomes evidence. Like big data is considered a form of evidence. As long as you have that, you are also pulling in research evidence and using both in conjunction to provide evidence-based care. So you are using it in um, practice. Personally, well, I think that the model was first addressed as perhaps applying to one particular hospital or a larger scale of a healthcare delivery system, which could be comprised of multiple hospitals. I see it as potentially applying on a larger scale across nations or even beyond. However, where are we now in developing connected health systems? We see fragmented policies. We have a lack of infrastructure that's needed to get us there and support a connected health system. We see ongoing data sharing issues across different, different vendor platforms. Uh, so that Cerner, if you're familiar with that vendor name, may not readily talk to EPIC. We have a lack of clarity and a real patchwork of laws across different countries. We have um, a lag time sometimes be before data can be accessed. We have different data protection laws across the globe. And we have issues with the quality of data that is produced. So if you have healthcare workers that do not fully appreciate the need for data quality, they may put something into the electronic or even a paper record, if you are still in a paper record, that is inaccurate or incomplete. If you have inaccurate or incomplete data, then it can negatively impact the care of a single patient but if you're looking at aggregate data, then it leads to the situation that has in the past been known as garbage in, garbage out. If you have poor quality data, then it will lead to garbage. Can you trust it? Can you use it to inform decisions with any level of confidence? Data sharing on a large scale is still fraught with a number of complexities. And we still have a number of knowledge and skill gaps among our healthcare workforce. So in order to arrive at a point that we have data sharing, we need to have public trust in how their data will be used. It requires great planning to create this learning health system, 
and connected health. We need to have good data governance. If that is a new term to you, it's a very important one that you need to understand because data governance is something that informatics nurses are often involved in and certainly need to understand. It entails establishing who controls data, who has access to, to data, who maintains data. So for instance, with some of the initiatives and collaboratives that I mentioned earlier, they needed to go through a data governance or data agreement uh, in terms of deciding who would input data, who would be able to access data, uh, what data uses were considered acceptable. And another issue that needs to be addressed is who's going to pay for the structure that is behind the data governance. Who will pay for the informatics and information technology and professionals? So we need the development of models of good data sharing policies. We need good comprehensive legislation and financial considerations, not only for the infrastructure to house data that may be shared, um, but also any rewards um, that need to come. So we need greater transparency. Right now, the entire data sharing picture is very murky. So data sharing principles, again, we need very clear ethical and legal framework for data collection and use. Data sharing is considered to be an ethical imperative Without data sharing, how can we address many of the health issues that we have? Study participants, because much of the literature still speaks to study participants, must be informed prospectively, not only how we traditionally think that their data may be used, but how might it be used or reused in the future? De-identification of personally identifiable information must be considered. And again, data must be formatted using widely recognized data and metadata standards. So metadata is data about the data. How and where will data be housed? A large healthcare delivery system that may have say 13 hospitals may have a central data repository and they use that. More and more we have a movement toward the cloud. This is not a dialogue that happens once to develop either just a learning health system or the connected health system. It's an ongoing dialogue that regards sharing and reuse of data. And we need to get the concept of being data stewards rather than data owners, because ownership connotes the idea that not only I have control, but no one else can use it, perhaps. Whereas stewardship is more of ethical responsibilities. And academic and societal rewards for data sharing, one, Example is if you are sharing data on research findings, for example, then who gets credit in terms of who shares it first, but who publishes first? So what's the attribution that needs to take place? Data sharing obviously has a number of benefits. We all learn. So why have a separate pot for this country, this state, um, this disease entity, when we all can benefit and we can all gain knowledge and wisdom as a result? We can improve patient outcomes individually as well as aggregate outcomes. Again, it's an ethical imperative. It's a means to make our healthcare delivery systems more effective, efficient, provide higher quality, and to do so with a lower cost. Data sharing is a prerequisite of 
precision medicine so that we can more effectively provide treatments and medications that are geared uh, for people based on their genomic traits. Sorry. So in closing, in closing, sorry, in closing, using data wisely means using, reusing, and sharing data to their maximum potential. And the source, Lorsen, is also in my list of references, which again, I'm sure Dr. Darvish will ensure the slides with the references are placed on the website. On that note, I thank you very much and ask if there are questions. Professor Thank you very Hepta. much. Thank you, Thank Dr. You much. Professor Hebda. Thank yeah. you so much. Dear Professor Hebda, please accept our deepest thanks and appreciation for your outstanding lecture. Thank you. Ladies and gents, we do not have plan for any kind of break in today's session. So now we're about to attend another wonderful lecture by Dr. Melody Rose. An adjunct professor at Franklin University, Doctor of Nursing Practice of Nursing Informatics, Emerson of Nursing Inform Informatics, RN license, and is a certified professional of healthcare informatics systems. Dr. Rose currently serves in clinical informatics at Ascension Healthcare. Rose, Dr. Rose has worked with Meditech, Mackison, now known as Allscripts and Cerner EHR Systems. Hello, Dr. Rose, we are waiting to hear it from you. Hello, and thank you. Um, thank you. I, was, I was very pleased to be uh, asked back to the uh, visit with the Tehran University of Medical Science students again. What a great honor it is to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to uh, move a little bit faster than I had planned um, because I know you guys have a little bit of a time in, um, uh, issue. So let's go over some objectives that I want to cover today. I want to identify and define big data as it applies to healthcare, identify databases developed through healthcare, discuss advancements in patient care through supporting technologies, identify and discuss remote and tele opportunities in healthcare. So what is big data and more important, what does it mean to healthcare for the patient and the clinician? So data is simply information. If I tell you five, red and water, I've just given you three different pieces of data. Until that data is assembled, it doesn't have meaning. Once it's assembled, it has meaning and you can draw knowledge out of it. Big data refers to large sources of data that are collected from many sources. When we talk in terms of healthcare, the sources could be electronic health records, pharmacies, public health departments, private practitioners, wearable technology, and many, many more sources. Together, these resources collect huge amounts of healthcare data. <clears throat> to move from data to big data, three areas are considered. The data is available in high volume. That's the first one. So let's think about that for a minute. Um, let's think about vaccinations because that seems to be on everybody's mind with, with COVID here. Um, EHRs from a hospital or electronic health records from a hospital provide vaccination um, information. Providers offices, when you go to your doctor, that they provide um, uh, vaccination information. How about pharmacies? Public health departments, clinics, dental offices here in the United States have offered to give vaccinations. Schools, managed um, special events. I was involved in a special event last year where we gave over 1,000 COVID vaccines in the parking lot of an M NFL football um, stadium. Even concerts offer, offered to give um, COVID vaccines. So this is an example of um, 
a high volume of vaccine information. All of these different locations that gave and give vaccinations create high volume of data. The next consideration is that the data moves in at a high velocity. So as the data moves in, it needs to be processed quickly into the health into healthcare. So that gives us a quick turnaround time. And then the last consideration is that the data structures are variable in nature. And we know this because they're coming from so many different um, sources. I also wanna mention, and I think Dr. Hebda mentioned this too, um, about a data lag or data latency. We are a society that has become accustomed to getting results fast. We, what was fast yesterday can be improved upon today, right? We want it faster today. There are two types of data latency. The first is delivery of data into the database. This fits in with the delivery of data at high velocity. The second type of data latency is delivery of data for recall. Once it's in the database, how fast can we get it out? At this point, the data is typically refined and assembled, although it doesn't have to be. So retrieving data that is already admitted into the database is the second type. What does big data do for healthcare? Well, first it creates very large databases that need to be sorted and aggregated. And how do we use this data, big data to our advantage? So from the databases, we hope we can find the information to improve and provide competent patient care. We also learn about our patients and we hope we learn about our care delivery system. We hope that we can reduce costs and provide better care. And I'm sure there are healthcare systems that are looking for a competitive edge over their neighbors. The bottom line is high quality data, big data helps optimize care as long as we are constantly in consistency about consistently evaluating data and applying new knowledge, integrating research, and then reevaluating for improvement. This is the cycle of improvement. One of the problems we run into is interpretation of the data because not all data is collected, not all data collected is alike or the data structures are not the same. Someone has to re review the data before and as it is aggregated. If all collected data was exactly alike, this would not be a problem, but from system to system and from intent of the data to interpretation of the data, we do not have a standardized data structure yet. So interpretation of the data because of multiple data structures remains a problem. Big data can yield great information, but there is a responsibility to interpret the data accurately. Knowledge that all populations may not be reported, reported equally needs to be taken into consideration. So here are a couple of examples. Rural communities may be underreported because of lack of technology or access to health care. Underreporting is a problem. If people cannot get to health care, they will not be included in health care reports. Cultural and, cultural and racial differences may not be fairly represented depending on interpretation. Data collection has to be appropriate across all populations to accommodate for, for potential disparities. Entire generations may be completely missed based on access. The very old and possibly the very young are two at-risk generations. Now it's possible our children are being reported on by their parents, maybe not consistently, but some data is probably being reported. But how about the elderly? Who speaks for them? Many elderly do not have an advocate that represents them and they are left out of healthcare reporting. We have to make sure all populations are being represented and represented equally. These examples only rep represent the beginning potential of disparities. As pandemics and war break out across the globe, other areas of, of consideration should be identified and accommodated for. So let me just mention that disparities can quickly arise in the form of natural disasters, such as weather patterns. Looking back at storms, Hurricane Maria in 2017 that hit Puerto Rico and other areas of the Caribbean have changed the landscape. Some of these areas still do not have reliable electric electricity. The devastation of Hurricane Maria also 
was also followed by other hurricanes, not quite as deadly, an earthquake, and now the pandemic. So how is healthcare being delivered there? How is data being collected? It may not be. I use this as an example, but there are other areas of the world that have had just as many devastating um, instances that are both man-made and natural disasters. So we have to consider these. As data is collected and aggregated, goals should include protecting the, data, the integrity of the data, working within identified national and international groups to adopt and maintain authentication protocols, routine auditing and data of data for secure, security and authentication should also be practiced. These are areas of practice that will help standardize reporting. So who does this? And I think Dr. Hebda gave us um, a great variety of um, uh, different organizations that can do this. But one place that's working towards the international standardization is the United Nations Statistical Division. The identified goal for this organization is compiling and disseminating global statistical information. By developing standards and norms for statistical activities, this organization can start to facilitate the coordination of international statistical reporting. Now, the UN Statistical Division has big data for many different topics uh, besides big data. Their website is robust and it has a lot of good information. So I would encourage you to go, go uh, look at their website. I wanna move on so that we don't run out of time. I wanna move on to artificial intelligence. AI is typically thought of as a computer system that makes decision based on data programs. In healthcare, determinants of care can be assisted by data and databases but ultimately require human intelligence for final decisions. Areas often looked to for artificial in intelligence assistance are machine learning, natural language processing, medical algorithms, and clinical decision support. So let's talk about these areas. Machine learning has transitioned into a convenience for many, cl many clini clinicians related to the use of software. Five years ago, a typical in-house training program for providers on an EHR may have been four hours long. Now we've cut that down to one hour or less time commitment because we can send them uh, computer-based training. They do homework at home. They come in, they provide competencies. They show us those competencies. If they can, um, then we set them up on the program and we let them go. So we've been able to decrease the amount of, of uh, classroom time and uh, let them provide uh, competencies. Natural language processing or speech recognition programs. This allows the provider to speak into the microphone or um, a mobile phone and dictate. The dictation can be completely narrative or start with a template that, that is modified. Once they're in the template, the cursor will go from predefined field to predefined field, allowing the user to either keep the content or dictate new content. Now, this is not new. This, these types of programs have been around for about 20 years, but they've improved. They do have some idiosyncrasies. If there are words that are not recognized, then the, the user can simply go into the background of the system, identify those words and train the system. Um, if, if, if it's a word that just constantly gives them a, pro, a problem, they can assign a shortcut to the word and be done with it. There are also a variety of other shortcuts that can be put in place for the motivated user that simply does not want to use a keyboard and always wants to dictate a patient record. Users will find their way, their own way with uh, natural language processing programs. I want to talk about medical algorithms. These are a byproduct of big data. As data has grown and pointed to key elements that are part of evidence-based treatment for diagnosis protocols, artificial intelligence can help by identify, help identify missing treatment steps by running medical algorithms. This is easier to explain by providing examples. So let me point to the 2017 
AHA, ACC, clinical performance and quality measures for adults with STEMI and non-STEMI myocardial infarction quality indicators. Now these quality measures are a result of many years of study. The end results are a list of do's and don'ts that can be built into a medical algorithm for the use in an EHR. Now I'm not gonna go over all of the indicators, but I will highlight a few of them and how we use them. Most patients that come into the facility and meet the, the treatment criteria of a STEMI or a non-STEMI myocardial infarction are treated emergently. But by the time of discharge, the emergency is passed and the patient is following a standardized treatment plan. One based on solid evidence-based practice. Quality measures should be tracked. Medical algorithms can do that. Throughout the patient's hospitalization, the medical algorithm will match the diagnosis code with a standardized treatment plan and identify steps of evidence-based treatment and make sure they've been met. At the time of, the, of discharge, a checklist can be presented to the provider to identify and correct or validate deviation from the standard treatment plan. So here's an example. The patient should have been given an aspirin at the time of arrival. If this was done, the medical algorithm just check marks this. The patient should also be placed on aspirin and a beta blocker at discharge. If this is done, the medical algorithm doesn't alert the provider. But if the beta blocker is not prescribed, and this happens a lot, the provider is gonna be notified so that he or she can make a notation that indicates why this has not been done. If the beta blocker was inadvertently left off, the provider has the opportunity to correct this before the patient is discharged. So the medical algorithm can also be set up to look at indicated data elements through reporting. Some of these data elements would be door to needle time, door in, door out time, door to reperfusion time, things like this. These types of data are true data elements that are automatically collected and aggregated for quality reporting. This type of data identification and collection helps the facility meet reporting criteria for quality measure programs. So two things, the medical algorithm aids while the patient is in-house by reviewing plan of care and watching for the indicators to be met. If not met, the system can provide alerts for the provider to document any type of deviation from the, from the evidence-based plan. And the medical algorithm also helps ensure data collection points for quality measure reports and make sure they're completed. This helps the facility meet standards for quality indicators and ultimately affects reimbursements. So let's talk about clinical decision support. This provides clini clinical workers with tools in the clinical workplace that help enhance decision making. This is usually at the bedside. Clinical decision support can be in the form of order sets specific to the patient we see this by diagnosis, by age, by gender. Um, we see it in the form of computerized alerts, clinical guidance, documentation um, templates. Uh, we can also see it in the form of support and reference material that gets pulled into the record, any kind of diagnostic references and many more aspects. So generally clinical decision support comes from or is linked from the electronic health record. As technology grows and needs expand, some non-traditional and non-medical vendors have partnered with the medical community to enhance the electric, electronic health record. And that's what I wanna talk about today. This is a non-traditional and a non-medical vendor as my example. And the example I'm using is Google. We all know Google is a great search engine if we wanna go find um, something trivial about uh, you know, a, a celebrity. Well, Google has been working with major healthcare corporations, and they've also just announced a partnership with an additional major EHR to insert a search engine. The design of the Google Care Studio search engine has proven useful to pilot providers and presented a great clinical decision support tool when searching through extended records. Now by extended, I mean looking across multiple encounters or admissions for the patient. Now, because I don't want to get into any type of legal situation, I will ask you to please go out and Google Google Care Studios for, for more information on the product. But I will put my personal disclaimer in here. I'm not endorsing the product. 
that wouldn't be a pro very professional thing to do. I'm just holding it up as an example um, of a non-traditional clinical decision support to tool. What I will tell you is that the providers that are using this tool at my facility like it very much. Um, I've worked with this product since the beginning of my employment uh, in 2019, and I've enjoyed the development process of the product. I think that the Google product ha uh, has enhanced and will continue to enhance healthcare functionality by looking as non-healthcare workers into our world. Sometimes as healthcare workers, we develop tunnel vision and we tend not to deviate from known behaviors. Having an outside view of healthcare brings new ideas. I will also point you to YouTube as a source of Google Care Studio as the introductory videos are available for anyone that wants to look at them and learn what Google Care Studio is. So let's talk about um, databases of uh, healthcare and big data. And Dr. Hebda did touch on some of this. There seems to be a digital divide when it comes to owning databases and then sharing databases. The, as a consumer trying to find one or a few all encompassing healthcare databases can be difficult. Um, the best guide to healthcare databases is the same guide when using research uh, researching healthcare websites. So I look for things that are .gov, .org, .edu, .mil, uh, because these tend to be more reliable and possibly more organized and potentially maintained. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are good databases, but potentially not open to the public. Um, I'm gonna actually move over some of this because we are running short on time. Um, I do want to point to uh, the World Health Organization as uh, because they do have uh, a good website. Um, they have an extensive uh, website that covers a lot of global regions and many topics. Um, there are several other websites. Uh, the United States has several good websites and Dr. Hebda has already covered a lot of this. So I am gonna move on to supporting technologies. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was telephony. So very various changes in technology have also allowed remote and centralized types of technology that enhance applications and telephony is one of them. Telephony systems have made it possible because of the controlled communication available. Now telephony systems are closed network systems that allow enhanced communications. Communication is done through telephone, email, text, instant me messaging, paging, and sometimes patient nurse call systems. These systems are secure, private. They run off of the facility, the corporate network, or and they are expandable. There is not a dependency on a telephone carrier in the United States, that would be AT&T or Verizon. The dependency is based on the reliability of the network infrastructure and its integrity. The communication is through phones and computers. Phones only work within the range of the facility or if the phone is behind the, the, um, fire or the net, network firewall. Facilities can elect to provide devices or allow users to download the application to personal devices. Applications can also be used on the computer. And when these systems first came out, patients were actually told that the nurses were not talking on their personal cell phone. They were using a new communication system. So because these telephony systems run off of a private network, the communications are private, they're secure. They meet Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. You know, this is HIPAA. So they meet HIPAA criteria. Patient orders are not allowed to go through the text and IM function of this type of application. There is not an auditable or historical record of communications through text and IM. Patient ordering is only allowed through the access of the EHR computerized provider order entry, which is now the acceptable and expected mode of patient ordering. Expectations of the telephony system are that every provider and caregiver has an assigned device with them for direct communication. 
we no longer have the call, have to call a secretary at the nursing station and page for a doctor or nurse to come to the desk for a phone call. This may be another job that's been replaced by automation. The patient call system now work through a telephony system. Patients are now provided with phone call, a phone code for their nurse and care team members. This may also include their doctor. Instead of pushing a bus button and waiting for someone to answer the call light and ask, how can I help you? They rely on, rely on a message um, to the appropriate team member. The patient calls the caregiver directly through the telephony system. So telephony has changed the game. Because it is a secure and private network, and this is the third time I've said this, it is secure and private, that no one outside of the identified users is available to use, is able to use. The telephony system opens up multiple options. Speed and dependability should be equal to the network it's built on. Communication throughout the facility, facilities, and potentially larger market area is available. Communicating with a caregiver via a networked telephony system has proven successful when supported by policy and procedure. All caregivers need to be on the network with assigned devices. Centralized hubs can successfully provide vital services, alerts, and information as identified. So let's talk about a few of the changes seen with networked telephony systems. Centralized telemetry monitoring. Now, when I started as a nurse, telemetry monitoring originated on the unit and required a de dedicated person watching a bank of monitors on the patient unit. As Wi-Fi capabilities improved, patients could be lo uh, located throughout the hospital and a centralized bank of monitors uh, was in the hospital. But as technology has improved, uh, namely the telephony system, uh, we can implement a centralized monitor hub and we can service multiple facilities. I'm currently working on a project that has set up three facilities. Soon that's gonna be four facilities in one centralized hub. Two facilities are in the same city. Two facilities are in different cities with approximately a hundred miles uh, between the furthest facilities. The four facilities use the same network, the same telemetry monitoring equipment and the same EHR. So by combining telemetry monitoring into a centralized hub, the facilities can utilize shared staffing for the monitor techs. Policies and procedures must be in place to make the system work. Each shift, the central hub must have a telephonic notification for patient nurse communication so they know who they're talking to. The monitor hub knows which nurse to call for which patient. Even though the central hub monitors the patient, each unit unit at the facility should have a slave monitor so that the nurses and the providers can review current and historical wave data. Monitor techs will move routine and significant wave data into the EHR per policy, but the slave monitors allow the caregivers to review waves at any time. In the situation of downtime, the slave monitors can be used to admit, dis and, admit and discharge patients to the telemetry at the facility and it can also be manned as a temporary monitor situation in, until the hub, the centralized hub is available. So downtimes could be as simple as something that's planned for maintenance. It could include something as natural disasters. Uh, for example, this week we had some weather um, that came through that, that could have taken out some of our um, uh, network, or it could be something as sinister as a cyber attack. Also, if the, simply if the telephony system has a, a failure for whatever reasons, the centralized hub would go down. So that would take the system down until it comes back up. Regardless of the origin, you have to have a practice downtime plan um, so that it can go in place immediately. For time's sake, I'm going to skip this next slide. And we're gonna move on to remote radiology or teleradiology. Um, remote radiology is not new. You know this um, as picture archiving communication, PACS. Um, it has been used since the late 80s, early 90s, and um, it has provided coverage for non-routine hours of work. 
Um, now I bring this up because a choice can be made for this style of work for the radiologist, radiologist to be either completely remote or to work in a, a brick and mortar facility. So this is um, a style of work that can now be done teleradiology. We're gonna move on to um, telecritical care, remote ICU, CCU. This is doctor on call versus doctor remoting in. Traditional brick and mortar facilities, staff and intensivists on site that services critical care areas. Policies and contracts to, uh, dictate if the intensivist is in-house 24 hours a day. At times, the intensivist may be occupied with other patients or sleeping or resting. Rural and smaller facilities may find it hard to attract intensivists based on where the facility is located and what they can pay. While well, remote care of critical care areas by intensivists can be provided through telecritical care. Remote Dear Dr. Rose, sorry yes. for an interruption. Um, thanks for your invaluable lecture and presentation. Uh, don't be um, afraid of time. You have extra time because we don't have any other lecturer. So um, you don't need to pace your lecture. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay. Um, with the uh, telecritical care, uh, we can remote an intensivist in uh, for routine coverage and critical care areas. And this can be done uh, either routinely or in an emergent fix. We need to know that the policies and procedures uh, support the practice. We also need to know that legislation and credentialing are important factors to consider. So nursing staff report to us that this is a viable option. Remote providers are easy to work with, immediately available, not really different from working with a physical provider standing at the bedside. Physical barriers such as uh, needing to intubate the patient or provide an invasive line, line or even do a procedure those will need to be addressed by policy and procedure. Sometimes you can have uh, an ER doctor come up or wait for an anesthesiologist to come in. So critical care areas need to have several cameras available. These need to be available to the remote provider so that he or she can control these cameras along with access to the, room, to the monitoring equipment and the EHR. Another area uh, that we see developing through TELA is uh, remote cons consultations. Psych and neuro are two areas that have developed this. The delivery of healthcare in the acute care setting has evolved by necessity. As specialties develop, the specialties locate to tertiary care facilities for application. So distinguishing the need for patients to be transported to specialty centers has come, become key in many ways. Um, I've put a simple diagram up as a quick explanation of the evolution of acute care. Prior to infrastructure that allowed sharing of healthcare records, a patient would go to a local hospital and usually stay there for treatment. Many hospitals were independent and did not want to give away their business. But as technology came into play, many of the independent hospitals, those local community county hospitals, became part of a bigger hospital corporation and that circumvented their need to keep their business. So becoming part of a larger organization was necessary because it made it affordable to purchase and maintain an electronic health record. It also helped them meet federal standards that required, uh, the federal standards required of an EHR. It helped them maintain security. And it also helps them with constant cyber attacks. So when a patient is seen at a provider office or clinic, it's considered primary care. A determination is made by the provider at that time if competent level of care can be given. If not, the patient can be referred to as a local hospital, and this is considered secondary care. Emergency Medical Services, EMS, also provides a primary care entry into the healthcare system and determines if the patient needs to go to a secondary care local hospital. Once at the secondary care level, if the level of care is needed, needed is determined to be higher, 
the patient can be transferred to a larger hospital. And this is considered the tertiary care. The tertiary care level facilities have the top areas of specialty. So this is where remote consultation comes in. Determining the necessary level of care at the secondary care facility can sometimes be done through remote consultations. Examples of this would be in specialty areas such as neurology and psychology. After initial assessment at the secondary facility level, consultations can be arranged for by a specialist. The specialist will see the patient through teleconferencing. A computer link is established through a secure connection using specialized computer equipment. Based on the results of the teleconference, the specialist will make a recommendation to transfer the patient to a tertiary care facility for a higher level of care or stay at the secondary care facility and maintain the current level of care. Benefits of teleconferencing a specialist into the secondary care, of, uh, secondary care level are a quicker time uh, to specialist consultation, reduction of unnecessary transfers, and that's a, a money reduction, patients receive appropriate levels of care and higher levels of care are received quicker. So a specialist provider needs access to the patient's EHR. The teleconferencing equipment should have video conferencing capability with cameras and the, the specialist also needs to be able to control that um, camera. Now, my last example is remote pharmacy. And this is exciting for me um, because this, this did change things for the nurses tremendously. This is uh, support from a centralized remote pharmacy. And this has made staffing for smaller facilities possible. Dependencies for remote pharmacy um, are, of course, policies and procedures in place. Um, the use of an EHR, we need automated medica medication dispensing machines, the use of identification, patient identification through barcode scanning. Um, we need barcode medication administration, and uh, we need medication order entry done through computerized provider order entry. So the workflow begins with an order put in by the, the provider through computerized provider order entry. The EHR allows the pharmacist to review the order remotely for validation. Once the order has been validated by the pharmacist, it's added to the patient's medication administration record and the nurse reviews it. The nurse reviews the order and locates the medication in the appropriate automated dispensing, uh, medication dispensing machine. So these dispensing machines are preloaded with all types of medication. Um, the, med the dispensing machines on the unit have the common medications the unit uses. If there's an unusual drug or drug dose that's not common to the floor, the, the nurse may have to go to a different location for the appropriate medication. If there's a question at any time, the nurse, the pharmacist, or the provider can be reached through the uh, telephony system. So once the appropriate medication is retrieved, the nurse goes to the patient bedside, scans the patient's armband, then they scan the medication and uh, the armband identifies the patient. The next scan of the medication barcode, um, I checks the EHR for and the medication for the right dose, the right route, the right time, any kind of patient med, uh, allergies, medication interactions, and alerts the nurse if any of these are not correct. Once the nurse documents the dose has been given, the dose can be deducted from inventory and patient charges can be posted. What cannot be done with remote pharmacy is a new combination drug that has to be mixed or some time, a type of a special compounding that has to be made. So the need for an on-site pharmacist will never go away, but the need for an overnight pharmacist can be decreased by use of a remote or centralized pharmacy. As always, policies and procedures must be in place for this to work. Licensure, location, and credentialing are also considerations. In some areas of the United States, licensure will not carry over, over state lines. So I know I went through a lot of this information quickly, and there's still a lot of um, tele-opportunities that we use, but these were some of the highlights that we use. 
Um, if you have questions, I can take those. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture, Dr. Rose. Um, if there is any question uh, for this lecture and Dr. Hebda's lecture, uh, it will be answered after the poll. As we've had both lectures, now I launch the poll to answer the post test questions. I kindly ask everybody in this room to answer the, the post test questions. Thank you. While you're answering the poll, we have to mention that the link of the registration is already available. So if there is anybody, anybody who has not registered yet, can do it easily now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose and Professor. Uh, actually, um, at the end, I want to say, um, please accept my deepest thanks and appreciations for the time and opportunity you give us through this program. Uh, it's a great honor to work with you. And uh, here I could see many participants were active in the previous short course on nursing informatics. And I want to express my thanks to them also. Uh, I think this course is valuable enough to not to miss any session. But if anyone missed this session, we will cast a record on our website. Uh, and if uh, you are interested, you can review our previous courses also. Next time, uh, we again will uh, see uh, different parts, uh, another part and second session next Saturday. Uh, and today, because of Iftar and uh, some of our participants ask us to uh, end the session um, 15 minutes before 8 p.m. Yeah, Tehran time. Um, but now um, there is, I think, uh, five to 10 minutes for the participants who have uh, some questions. And uh, even we can 
unmute and they can speak or they can write their questions in the chat box. So please, if anyone has a question, uh, can speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammadi also. Thank you, Dr. Professor Hepta and Dr. Rose. Thank you so much. Also, thank you, Appraise to Raise team for their uh, very nice support, our students and our colleagues. We have someone who raised his hand or her. I think it was a he. I'm sorry, I missed the name. Would you speak? Hello, I am Hamdia from Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Tehran University for Medical Science, and also you both, uh, Dr. Tebda and Melody Rose, for your uh, very hard <laughs> presentation. Um, I would like to ask these things that you talk about that uh, is uh, it is very well developed in your country or it is just uh, at the base of theory uh, uh, or need um, many a study or uh, it is at the uh, level of the pilot study or what? If you uh, tell us about that and there is any um, maybe complication or ethical problem that may happen uh, because of using this teletechnology and telehealth. Uh, do you have any solution for that or not? Thank you. So are, are you speaking of um, the EHR or telehealth or um, all of it wrapped up together? I think all of it. Uh, all, of it? all of them, all of okay. them, yes. We, we started using the EHR um, effectively uh, in about 2011 um, when, when the federal government got involved and tied money with it. We had actually started implementations way back in 2005, 2006, and couldn't really get a lot of traction because there wasn't an incentive financially to the hospitals. But once the federal government tied money to it, um, we got a lot of traction and uh, the administration got behind it. So from about uh, the time uh, the Affordable Care Act got signed by the federal government, um, we started becoming successful. So um, we gained a lot of traction at that time. We started putting systems in. Um, the EHR became more functional um, and they took a stair-step approach of what we implemented in two to three year um, implementation cycles. Now, segue up to COVID, um, what is that? <laughs> you know, uh, 10, 11, 12 years later, thank goodness we had um, a lot of the infrastructure in place because we used that all of a sudden. We had the, um, the technology in place to realize that we could um, do telehealth and uh, we could do it securely and protect people's privacy. Um, we could... Um, transport people across state lines. So here's an example. A couple of years ago, my daughter who lives in New York needed to have some surgery and she came to Nashville to do that because she doesn't know anybody in New York, but mom does. And I provided doctors for her. So she brought her telehealth record here and had her surgery here. Well, you know, 20 years ago, she couldn't have done that, but through the, all of the work we had done, um, yes, she was able to do that. So on a scale of one to 10, are we developed or not? I would say we're at a seven and a half and we can do better. Um, those first few years we struggled just like everybody else. We struggled, but we've done a lot of work. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Hamida, for your 
nice question and thank you dr rose for very nice answer uh, can you see i think there is no more question we will wish everyone a wonderful um holiday uh and observance and look forward to seeing you next week yes um i think there is a question in the chat box is there is there any question please uh, mrs smiley if there is any question resend it in the chat box then we can see if not please write down there is no any question thank you so much ah did you see that which classification is recommended in nursing for AI statistics? Who, you in? Okay, I think this is a question from Dr. Rose. It's about AI, artificial intelligence. I'm muted. And, and um, Dr. Rose, I'm not sure that I can address that. Uh, I'm not sure I can address it either because it's, uh, it's um, classification is recommended for nursing for AI statistics. I don't know that there's a recommendation between the two. Um, the, uh, both who, uh, the World Health Organization and UN I have found I have refined data. Um, I like unrefined data. I like to see what I'm looking at um, rather than what someone gives me. So it depends on what you're looking for. Um, I like to go for the unrefined data and collect my own um, statistics off of it. So okay. I, no problem. It's uh, I think it's a very difficult question and yeah. We all should uh, search for it and see there, is there any answer or not. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I think now we can wish all the people who are fat um, and uh, God accept their prayer. And um, actually, we can end the session. Mr. Mohammadi, can you uh, ask people to yes. open their Thank webcam? You to take a group photo and uh, the end the session. Thank you. At the end of today's meeting, it is good to take a virtual group photo. Please join us by turning on your webcams and we may take it before leaving. Thank you all.
Thank you all for your participation and thanks to Dr. Hepta, Professor Hepta, Dr. Miller Rose, and Dr. Asil Darvish, and director of this program, Dr. Khatar Seilani, and Dr. R.P. Manukian for, uh, as International Affairs of School of Nursing and Midwifery at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Thank you all. And also Dr. Uh, Azadi. Yes. She's always with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Azadi. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye to all. We hope to see you for next session, next Saturday.